Hello, kings, queens, nerds, and geeks. Powdered Milk here, and welcome back to Fallout Equestria. I don't know why I'm talking like this, but hey, we're back. And guys, we finished the chapter six part er, uh, of chapter 37, and now we're in chapter 38. It's about an hour and a half. And, well, actually, no, it's almost two hours. Actually, it's th an hour and 50 minutes. And it's called Peace in Our Time. And um, I'm pretty curious what happens next because we kind of ended in a cliffhanger in the last one. And, um, technically they're all ending in cliffhangers, but y you get the point. Like, some of them had, some of them had more climactal endings to the chapter. So, this one, um, I'm kind of very curious to find out what happens next. What little Pip is planning to do next. So. Enough. My abused body was through. My nerves didn't even have the will to scream at me anymore. My muscles ached dully, my insides hurt, and my pip leg itched. I could feel the mud slowly squishing in between my armor and coat, seeping through the hole the Ultra Sentinel had burned in my chest. I didn't care. My friends needed me. Velvet Remedy was unconscious. Oh, please, let her just be unconscious. I had tried to save her from drowning. But she'd gone under more than once, and now she was just laying there, unmoving. A few yards away, the Sky Bandit was half sunk in the lake, the front end thrust upwards over the muddy shore. I heard a grunt from the air to my left where Calamity hung from the Sky Bandit's harness. Ugh. Ugh. Calamity's legs kicked circles in the air. Oh, pony feathers. My attention was focused on Velvet Remedy. I was desperate to get closer to her, to see if she was all right, but my body ignored me. I tried to pull her close, but my magic flickered over her limp form and died. Too much strain. She wasn't breathing. I could see no lift and fall from her body. Oh, goddesses. No. Velvet Remedy wasn't breathing. No. Calamity! I shouted hoarsely. Terror surging through me. Velvet's not breathing. You have to help her. I'm trying, girl. Calamity shouted back, suddenly thrashing in his harness. Oh, no. I can't get down. His wings flapped and his hooves kicked. My mind was exploding in panic. Every second, she was dying. And I still couldn't get to her. Couldn't even crawl. My horn flared with the surge of adrenaline. There wasn't quite enough in me to wrap around Velvet, but that flush of power was enough to pull apart the clasps of Calamity's harness, dropping the rust-colored Pegasus into the mud. He scrambled to Velvet's side and began pumping his hooves against her breasts, pausing only to breathe for her. Behind him, a groan rose up as the Sky Bandit slipped further into the lake. With a start, I realized that Steelhose was still in the back of the passenger wagon, paralyzed and dead in his armor, unable to move as he sunk further into the water. I knew he couldn't drown, but the thought of being trapped in a watery grave had to be horrifying. My mind immediately conjured up memories of my nightmarish imprisonment in the healing booth. Oh my god, I can just imagine that. Because ghouls can't really die of natural causes. He doesn't need food, he doesn't need anything to live. And the fact that he's still alive, probably conscious, paralyzed because the suit doesn't come off. Imagine what would happen if he stayed under there. Trapped forever, conscious, in a grave that you can never die. He doesn't need air. He doesn't need water, oxygen. Uh, he, he do, I already said air, but he doesn't even need food. He doesn't need anything to live. He'll be stuck down there forever in a watery grave, watery underwater grave. I think it's water, right? Or is it mud? I, I, fuck, I terrible memory. Calamity continued fervently, trying to bring life back to Velvet Remedy. Tones of gray bled into my vision. My whole self cried out for rest, begging me to just let go, just go and sleep. But I fought the cool embrace of darkness the little pony in my head kicking and screaming, telling me that if I let it overtake me, I would never wake up again. 
if I lost consciousness now, I could slip into a coma. And somehow, I knew it wouldn't be a peaceful sleep. All the nightmares of the healing booth awaited me down there. I heard a choked, sputtering cough from Velvet Remedy. My panic lifted, my heart crying out. Thank the goddesses. The grip of panic eased around my heart and mind, and blackness rushed in like a surging ocean. I thought I heard Calamity fire his battle saddle and yell something, but he sounded so far away. Then, nothing. Visions of my life in Stable 2 passed before my eyes. Boring, dull, safe, gray. Devoid of any real life, empty of friends or of purpose. A job where I was helping no pony. Out of a sense of responsibility and hope, I braved the possible nothingness beyond the stable door, leaving that peace behind. I traded all of it for pain and horror as I searched for her. I remembered my first day and how the daylight seemed so strange to me, beautiful yet odd and unhealthy, strained by the curtain of clouds above us. I saw how stupid and foolish I had been, plunging headlong into places like iron-shod firearms in Stable 24, repeatedly risking my life, and later those of my friends, all because I was driven by curiosity and a need for answers. At this point, I was lucky to still be alive. My friends swam before me, my fearless first friend, Calamity, always by my side, always ready to catch me when I fell. I owed him my life, over and over. Velvet Remedy, the real mare, not the one of my foolish fantasies. The one with the caring heart who tended to me while I was sick, and who took my burden when the return home was too much for me to bear. Steel hooves, met in battle with a flurry of explosions. I had seen him conquer his own demons to fight alongside Zenith, and to finally step up and lead a new force for the good of Equestria. And Zenith herself, pulled from Red Eye's hell of industry and slavery, a tortured mare, a survivor who became our guide in Old Olney, one of the most grim and deadly places the Wasteland had to offer. My mind was filled with voices, the voice of DJ Pony broadcasting out of Manhattan, bringing messages of warning and hope, and making us out to be heroes. I remembered that first real voice from the past, that message from Scootaloo, a hello from one of the ponies who had shaped the world and watched it fall. From them, I learned of virtues, of sacrifice, and of failure. Even though they were gone, they had become my family almost as much as my living friends. I was no longer alone. I recalled moments of joy, times I had almost forgotten. Breakfast with God at Junction R7. My water fight with homage in the pouring rain. My head filled with shadows. The horribly damaged Pinky Bell with her balefire bomb she was saving for fireworks. The accidental shot. Blam. On Buckland Bridge. I dreamt that I was drowning in blood. A crimson river from all those whom I had slain. The memory of Arbu transformed that terror into reality. Of all the things I had struggled against, raiders and slavers, zombie zebras, and even a dragon, the greatest threat had always been from myself. The darkness and rage that hid within me. Addiction and failure. My soul was weary. I needed rest. Hadn't I been through enough? I had tried to do good. I had tried to help. I had pushed myself through torture and horror. Death awaited me, and I could hear the sweet casualing song of the Grim Reaper Pony, offering me a final respite. I wanted to go to her, let her wrap me in her cloak of blackness and unending sleep. But even here, the little pony in my head fought with me, reminding me that there was still too much to do before I could allow myself peace. There were still ponies who needed me. Red Eye still threatened Ten Pony Tower and my beloved homage. There was still a goddess out there, bent on the extinction of pony kind through unity. As long as you're willing to face the fire. Well, fuck. My little pony was right. As much as I yearned otherwise, I had to return. To regain consciousness. 
I moaned, rolling onto my side. My body was covered in a sickly sweat. Unpleasant warmth rushed through me, and my head and stomach churned with nausea. I itched from dried mud. I was laying on a filthy cot in a ramshackle wooden structure that stank of damp wood and rot. I tried to push myself up, my legs trembling weakly before giving out. The effort caused my gut to rebel, and I found the strength to roll over and vomit. Mercifully, there was an old mop bucket next to the bed, seeming to exist just for the purpose of being filled with my sickness. My throat burned, the inside of my mouth turning horrid. The stench of my vomit made my eyes water, and drove my stomach to churn and release even more. I collapsed back, tears in my eyes. This had happened before. Illness brought on by physical overexertion, mental turmoil, and the nastiness of the wasteland. We needed to go, do things. I didn't have time to be bedridden again for days. Canterlot had been physiologically brutal. The pink cloud on the broadcasters putting my brain and insides through a grinder. The loss of a rib was traumatic and terrifying. The scar there, like the one on my neck, would never quite fully heal. My pit buck had fused my coat and flesh. Was it any surprise that my health was falling apart now? The memory orbs had been emotionally gut-wrenching. Part of me screamed to gallop back to the Ministry of Peace and give Rarity a proper burial. But even before we had left the Ministry of Awesome, the fires and cloud had made that impossible. The heart-rending blow of watching Applejack step out of that elevator, and realizing that Applesnack had intended to propose to her that very night, and she was anticipating it. Goddesses. I fought to get up, only to fail again. I couldn't be this weak. My sickness could be costing lives. Goddesses, where was I? My eyes moved slowly over the filth. A few empty bottles, rubbish, a doorway without a door, and the stained sheet that covered it. Not steel of shack. Now, let's get you set up just like that. I heard Calamity's voice drift in from the next room, followed by a loud thump of metal against splintering wood. I felt the urge to call out for him. The guy was fine enough to let me rent this here set of magically powered armor long enough for us to reboot you. Should have you mobile in no time. Are you sure you know what you're doing, Calamity? Still his voice followed his. You gotta remember he was Maybe his... you should wait for little Pip. What? And leave y'all stuck like this? Zenith's voice chimed in. Is it wrong that I want to stick him in poses? Even feeling as wretched as I did, I had to bury my muzzle into the mattress to stifle a snicker. It felt better knowing that three of my friends were just on the other side of that filthy curtain. <laughs> Try it, and I'll hurt you. Seela's warned, grumbling. Calamity, hurry up already. So which end do I plug this into again? Calamity asked, feigning confusion. The levity in his voice betrayed him. Just hurry up, before the zebra gets any other ideas. Oh my god. <laughs> Thank you, Stilovs, Zenith said quietly, for helping my daughter's village. I know it must be hard for an old soldier to help Zebrakin. I mentally grasped at that through the swimming in my head. We were in Glyphmark. Through the doorway, I realized the next room had fallen still. Applejack was afraid of zebras. Stilos finally said. It took her little sister to show her that they were people just like ponies. Good folks, most of them. I listened, surprised, as Applesnack opened up to Zenith. She never forgot that. Not even in the blackest hours of the war. Not even when her closest zebra friend betrayed her. His voice seemed to freeze. Stilos' low, rumbling voice dropped impossibly lower. Or so we believed. Again, the room beyond mine filled with a pregnant quiet. Applejack would have wanted her rangers to protect all good people, not just ponies. I loved Steelhoves a little more at that moment. After a second or two, 
Calamity spoke up, changing the topic. So how are they? Neither has woken yet. Zenith's voice turned solemn. Neither. Velvet Remedy was still unconscious? I once again felt a twinge of panic. How long had it been since Canterlot? Although Little Pip still moans and mutters fevered things in her sleep. Little Pip is awake, Steele has announced. She is probably eavesdropping. I also hated Steele's just a little bit right then. Go ahead and put him in silly poses, Zenith. I was shivering when Zenith came in. Somehow, my body had gone from overly hot to unpleasantly cold. So the metal ghoul was right, Zenith intoned casually. You are awake. What about Velvet? She still slumbers, Zenith informed me. I have given her what salves and remedies I know, but only she can find her way back as you have done. She will, I assured her. Velvet remedy's stronger than she looks. Yes, and so are you, little Pip. The zebra said as she placed a hoof on my forehead, just below my horn. I groaned. Well, that's pretty easy when you look pathetic. Xana smirked ever so slightly. We need to go, I started to say, trying a third time to stand. I forced my forehoofs under me, lifting myself just enough to reach the mop bucket as another wave of nausea swept over me. Zenith watched as I vomited. You are sick, she said grimly, and quite unnecessarily. You need to rest. I will not allow us to go until you are well enough for the journey. Another day at least. Maybe two. How long? I asked, spitting into the bucket of sick, trying to clear the acidic foulness from my tongue and teeth. Less than a day, Zenith told me. Calamity has been negotiating with your trader friend to get the things you need, and he's been putting armor on our flying vessel. If there's one thing Glyphmark is not poor in, it is scraps. I had wondered when he was going to get around to doing that. Nodding, I tried to reason with Zenith. One night. But then we have to go. I'll prop myself up with crutches if I have to. No, Zenith said flatly. I decide when we go, and I say, not until you are at least able to walk on your own and hold food. Only then will I consider it. Assuming that the medical pony hasn't woken by then and had you chained down until you're fully healthy. Assuming that the medical pony hasn't woken up by then and had you chained down until you're fully healthy. I moaned, slipping back onto my bed. We couldn't wait for that long. You just repeated yourself. Especially if Velvet Remedy did decide to chain me down until I got better. Something Velvet was more than capable of, I realized. Zenith might not know that, but then the zebra wasn't there when Velvet shot me. I can recover on the ride to Splendid Valley, I told her, recalling having said something similar to Velvet Remedy after Arbu. But the mere thought of riding in the Sky Bandit made my head whimper and my stomach twist unpleasantly. Okay, okay. Once I can hold down some food. I wasn't going to subject the others to a ride in the passenger wagon with me while I spent the whole trip with my head in a bucket. My mind wandered for a moment, trying to retrace the days. How long ago had Velvet Remedy shot me with a poison dart gun? How long since I had left Stable 2? My whole life was condensed into... What? Eight weeks? Over a month and a half, and not quite two months. The equally miserable little pony in my head pointed out that between now and Steelhose Shack, I'd used up all of my sick days and soon the master pitbuck technician would have to start docking my allowance. I found myself giggling. Laughter, Zenith mused. A sure sign of regaining health, or slipping into insanity. That just made me giggle harder for no good reason. Zenith got up, taking the mop bucket's handle in her teeth. The stench from it had begun to permeate the room. I felt simultaneously thankful to her, and embarrassed at my disgusting frailty. 
I was sorry to be the reason she had to do something so unpleasant. My mind caught on something as she trotted towards the filthy curtain. Zenith, how's your daughter? And have you told her about it yet? The zebra stopped. She set down the bucket of vomit and turned to me. Zephyr is doing well. She is the doctor for these townsfolk, and she plies her craft well. She is very thankful for what we have done down here. Zenith sat down, staring off into the air. She and the others of her village have released me from my responsibility, so I am free to go. She looked at me sternly. As to your second question, no, and I wish that you would not tell her. I nodded. But shouldn't she know? And, Zenith, you deserve to be reunited with her. Zenith smiled sadly. She is her own mare now, not the little girl I knew. I would rather she keep that strength than submit to being my child again. She looked away. And to be truthful, I cannot be responsible for her. I do not know how. Plus, you need me. Far more than she does. With that, Zenith stood back up, taking the mop bucket once again, and walked out, the curtain waving in her passing. I laid there for some time, unsure of how to feel. Part of me was happy that Zenith would be with us again. Another part of me, the part which deeply wished for a happy ending for my friends, was softly crying. I wasn't even sure why. My own mother, as much as I loved her from a distance, was not as important to me as my friends, and I would not wish to sacrifice my time with them, or the good I was trying to do, for a reunion with her. So why did my heart desire for Zenith and Zephyr to be together? I shivered again. Part of me wanted to pull down that disgusting curtain and wrap myself in it. But a better part of me shuddered at the thought. And I knew that if I did, I would just become too hot again. Instead, I curled up. A wave of weariness began to pass over me. We... I... needed Zenith. I needed her. We were stronger together. Better. I would need my friends. Soon, as soon as I was well enough to function, we would be enacting my plan, whatever that was, to deal with the goddess. I moaned as another shiver quaked through my body. Suddenly, I felt nervous. Scared. I was about to risk our lives with a plan I didn't even know. I was trusting myself, which was beginning to feel awfully stupid. They all trusted me, but why should they? I hadn't told them what I was doing, just their specific parts. No one knew what we were doing. This was insane. I've got a plan for dealing with the goddess. I've told every pony their parts, and just their parts. I'm the only pony who knows all of it. And then I took that knowledge from myself, and locked it away in the orb sitting far away in Ten Pony Tower. What was I thinking? Literally, what was I thinking? I've told every pony their parts, and just their parts. Every pony. Oh, because the goddess couldn't read zebra minds. A smile broke across my muzzle. Ooh, I was a clever pony. She did what? Calamity gasped, startling me from the near sleep my aching body had fallen into. Damn it, little Pip promised me. Oh no. What did I do? I immediately felt awful for whatever I had done to upset Calamity. Calm yourself, Steelhoofs commanded softly. Everything was fine. Was Steelhoofs mobile yet? It didn't sound like he had moved. The idea that he might still be paralyzed within his armor was horrible. I thought of how he had been trapped helpless under the water, and prayed to Celestia and Luna that he had been pulled out quickly. Fine. I was gone. You were mobile, and Little Pip goes poking ahead into a whole heap of mess and memory orbs right in the middle of the candlelight ruins? Calamity roared. 
Damn it. I know that Mary ain't got no sense at all sometimes, but I expected her to treat her promise better than that. Oh. What did she expect Velvet to do if she was attacked? Or if the cloud got in? To turn on the shield, Steele have said simply. Calamity stopped mid-rant. Say what now? We were inside the Ministry of Awesome, within the shielded zone. If anything happened, Velvet Remedy could have just protected us with the throw of a switch, Steele has informed him, adding the jab. Or don't you trust Rainbow Dash's defenses? I could hear Calamity let out a defeated sigh. Ugh, fine, okay, okay. She's not responsible for Velvet Remedy's condition, Steele has added. In fact, she risked drowning to save her. I know that, and I'm not mad at her cause of... Hell, I'm not mad at her. I'm just mad, Calamity admitted. Feels better than being worried sick. I heard a crack of wood, and dust shifted down from between the ceiling boards as the small building shook from Calamity's kick. I could understand his sentiment. <sighs> Hell of a time to let every pony down, Calamity. What? I seem to recall you saved them. My thoughts echoed Steel of Sentiment. Calamity had caught us, and then he saved Velvet when I couldn't. Yeah, well, they wouldn't have needed so much saving if I'd just flown us out of there. My fault we ended up in the moat. Hell, I don't even remember touching down. Calamity! I called out weakly. Stop! Just... not your fault. That was all the energy I had to shout, and it left me panting. The orange-maned Pegasus poked his head through the curtain, hovering a pony's height off the floor. Lil' Pip? I'm, I'm sorry. I thought you were asleep. Part of me regretted letting him see me like this. I was drenched in sweat. My coat was matted to my skin beneath. I hadn't bathed since being dropped in the mud. I shook my head, then weakly hoofed waved him in. The Pegasus landed to pass through the doorway, stepping up to the old stained mattress that served as my bed. Can I get you anything? Water? A blanket? He frowned. Not sure we got any of those, and the water here ain't exactly the best neither. I wanted both, but I asked for neither. Calamity, thank you, I said, smiling as best as I could. Velvet and I both owe you our lives. You were awesome. He shook his head. Thanks all the same for saying, but... But nothing. It's... It's been hard and hurtful on all of us. Sometimes I just want to... I just want to stop... I trailed off, ashamed. I felt like I wanted to stop a lot lately. Yeah, I know what you mean. A lesser pony would have called it quits a long time ago. Calamity laid down next to me. Hmm. He pulled out the pink gem and set it between us. Thank you for this, little Pip. I got right messed up in the head after Buckland Cross. I hate what happened there, and it was sending my mind into dark places. You gave me something to remind me that we're the good guys. We don't always get it right. Hell, sometimes we mess it up real bad. But we keep trying, and there are folk better off thanks to us. I nodded, staring into the gem. I hate this plan of yours, Calamity told me bluntly. Once again, you're going to some place insanely dangerous alone. And once again, you're the only one that can do it. I hate that. I'm going in alone. The idea of going into Maripony, or worse, all of Splendid Valley, alone, terrified me. I no longer like this plan either. On the other hoof, it didn't exactly surprise me. I knew myself far too well. Any chance to spare my friends the danger, any way I could make this my burden alone. I would take it. 
I had done it again. Y'all remember what that place did to us last time? Calamity reminded me. And we were all together then. Calamity? I asked, worried now. What can you tell me about the plan? Calamity blinked. His eyes widened as he realized what I was asking. What? Y'all don't know? I mean, I know you had your memories removed, but... You really don't know nothing about the plan. Now he was beginning to panic. Didn't you even, you know, leave yourself any notes? Notes? Where would I... I stopped. Damn it, of course. My pit buck. How could I have not thought of that before? Slowly, I lifted my right foreleg, my gaze sliding to the dead screen of my pit buck. Um... Calamity, you rebooted Steelhoof's armor, right? Is he able to move again? I felt supremely stupid and foolish. Calamity winced. Uh, actually, no. My eyes widened. Steelhoofs have been immobile this whole time? Turns out, it ain't exactly as easy as it looks. I ain't a certified pickbuck technician and toast repair pony after all. Well then, like how that's still a joke. I started to pull myself off of the mattress. I like how that's still an inside joke of them. I like how the toaster thing is still a joke for them. Ah oh, man, of all fairness, I I love these guys' as friendship. They stick together. Even though they just met, like, look at, look at Calamity. He stuck around because he felt personally responsible. And now they're good friends. Look at Velvet. They're good friends. And now they're, her and Velvet, uh, Calamity and Velvet are together. Uh, Zenith is still being taken, is holding responsibility to Pip. And Steel Hooves, he just feels inspired by Pip. They're, they look up to Pip. It's just an amazing story, guys. I just want to cry because of how good it is. I really do want to cry. Uh. Mm. Guys, I, I, I love this story so much. Well, anyway, we gotta, we gotta get see if they get Steel Who's back on his feet again. Longer. Excuse my me. four legs trembled, and my stomach shot me a queasy warning. I looked around but the mop bucket wasn't back yet. I laid back down, putting a hoof over my muzzle and trying to force my insides to remain still. Could you please, uh, bring him in here? My head was swimming again. Trying to remember just what I needed to do was like slogging through belly-deep sludge. I needed tools, the spell matrix master key, and something to reboot him from. Also, could you fetch my utility barding and... You borrowed magically powered armor from some pony, right? I'll, I'll do my best, Calamity said, looking chagrined. He's uh, kind of heavy. I nodded, wondering how they got Steelhoves inside in the first place. Or out of the water. My eyes widened as I remembered something else. There was a shot. Calamity started, jumping up and looking around. Where? You sure? I didn't hear nothing. I shook my head, whimpering slightly at how sick the sudden movement made me feel. No, before. At the lake. You shot something. Calamity visibly relaxed. Oh, that shot. I was catching the griffin's attention. Apparently some folks tend to notice when a passenger wagon falls out of candlelight. Steelhoof sat silently by my side. I was feverish and having trouble focusing, but I was finished. I started disconnecting my pit buck from his armor, glancing once more at the set of badly damaged power armor laying in the corner. I'm sorry, I told him, wiping a sick coat of sweat from my face. We should have had you moving faster. I felt so tired. Steelhoof said nothing but it wasn't a damning silence. 
His tail shifted. I pulled my tools away for him. Done. I cast another look at the armor Calamity had rented for this and winced. Sometimes things were just unfair. It was Steel Ranger armor, badly torn up, but with a still functional spell matrix that I've been able to use to restore my pit buck, and then use my pit buck to restore steel hooves. There were still traces of pony blood on it. I had chosen to restore my pit buck first, not merely because it was easier, but because I felt steel hooves would rather not be connected directly to the other armor. The magically powered armor had been taken from the body of one of the rangers we had killed in Stable 2. From the damage, it was a pony whom Steelhoofs had put down himself. Steelhoofs stood up. He tested each leg, then stretched. Thank you, little Pip, he said solemnly. Now rest. I curled up, part of me hating that he saw this, but unable to properly care about it. I really wanted nothing more than to sleep, and hopefully not dream. I watched him as he turned towards the doorway. He would just walk out as if everything was concluded. But it wasn't. Apple snack, I whispered, but I knew he heard it by the way he stopped. I wasn't sure if this was what I should do, but no more secrets. I saw you. You see me often. In one of the memory orbs, in the ministry, I told him. It was the memory of a guard. He was assisting Zakor on a mission, to help get her close to the Kaisar. Steelhoof said nothing, but the temperature in the room seemed to drop. You... you were going to propose to Applejack that night. I looked at him, my heart squeezing in my chest. I'm so sorry. Closer to the Kaisar. Steel has repeated. To do what? I closed my eyes. I don't know. Spy on him, I think. Or to assassinate him. I shook, feeling a chill that was more from sickness than reaction to his words. I don't know. But I don't think so. I wasn't sure why. Maybe it was the way Zakora had worried about pony deaths or how her inexpert fighting skills had caused her to likely kill my host by accident. But I just didn't feel like Zakora was that kind of a killer. I cringed as I realized that I was. She was a spy. Simmer down, Sally. Zakora ain't no spy. The world was filled with sharp-edged irony. Steelhoof stood there, as unmoving as he had been all day. Finally, he said, It wouldn't have mattered. Killing the Kaisar wouldn't have stopped the war. The Legatus Legionis would have simply stepped in. And if anything, he was worse. I swallowed, my mouth tasting filthy. Steelhoofs, Apple Snack, I'm not judging you. I'm saying... What was I saying? I fought for words. I'm saying that I understand now. I know what you meant when you said I made it easier for you to live with yourself. And, for what it's worth, I'm sorry. He nickered. Applejack never knew the truth about Sakura either. I told him. And she loved you. She tried to fight for your relationship because she loved you. And, I think, because she understood. Not approved, but understood. Steelhoofs walked out. I was trapped. Buried alive. I think it was good that she told him. Because I believe in, all, in some truths, no matter how much they hurt, they have to be told. They have to be mentioned. It has to happen. And that is that. And... Even if it's the worst thing ever, I believe it should be mentioned.
Steel Hooves himself, yes, is a, is a murderer. He's neutral when it comes. He's chaotic neutral. That's his type of character, I believe. I think that really puts a a light shed on a steel hoops. That he doesn't, he's not on any one side. Of things he only sees things what he thinks is good. Hell, he could change his mind and think the zebras are on the good side this time. In this kind of case, yeah, it is. The zebras are on the good side. Well, well, the. Uh, well, there goes my phone. For whatever reason. But, uh... In this case, the zebras are good. And some ponies... A lot of ponies are bad. Hell, hit the, the steel rangers are bad. And the, uh... Well, not all the steel rangers, but, um... Then there's, um... Red Eye. And... Others and others and others like the ra like the raiders and the slavers. I've encased in a coffin of metal. There was no air. I couldn't breathe. Sounds, horrible, horrible sounds came at me out of the darkness, warping unearthly tones, rending sounds, the sounds of saws. I tried to back away, but there was no room. My backside hit a smooth surface, not metal, but glass, and I felt a shock of cold. My hooves splashed into the sticky warmth of blood. I could smell the sick, coppery stench. My healing booth coffin was filling with it. You cut a bloody swath through them. How many ponies are dead tonight because of you, little Pip? Velvet Remedy's voice echoed accusingly, provoking a sickening deja vu. How many ponies have you slaughtered? The blood was the blood of Arbu. It sure didn't take you long to become a mass murderer, did it, little Pip? The sound of the saw was getting closer. It intended to cut me apart with ragged teeth, to slice open my head and take my brain. Strange symbols appeared, floating in front of me, alien glyphs of ancient zebra design. But unlike the sounds and voices in darkness, their pulsing lines of crimson and black were soothing. They shifted in odd dimensions, offering to unlock themselves, to protect me. I knew these, and they were blasphemous. I turned away. I was facing the mirror. I stared back at myself, bleeding, dying. Little Pip the Raider. My expression was grim, hateful even. The stream of blood was pouring out of the mirror the blood of Arbu coming from my body, mixing with my own. The saw was getting closer. I could feel the wind from its gnarled, spinning teeth blasting my mane. It was going to cut out my heart, rip me open and wrench out my spine. It would hurt, hurt so badly. But I wouldn't be allowed to die. Let us help you, the glyphs whispered. You have no power. You have no purpose. Let us give you purpose. I have a purpose! I shouted at the raider little Pip in the mirror. I'm not the Wasteland Savior, Homage. I heard myself saying. You are. You and them. I'm just the one who clears the way. You could be the Savior, the glyphs whispered, floating in the air around the mirror. I realized I could almost understand them. Let me show you secrets. I don't want your secrets, I shouted at the glyphs. But I was lying. I had seen the blackness that the book held, the horror. But you've seen how much good we can do in the hooves of the right pony. You cannot deny. I, I whimpered falteringly. I knew that was true. Even the blackest magic could be used for good. But... I'm no rarity. I'm weak. 
I could make you stronger. Better. No. Don't. Don't. My gaze locked on the raider in my soul. She trembled, dying from blood loss. She was grotesque, horrible. I'm not this, I cried out. I have a purpose. It... it's not us, is it? I heard my voice cry. We're not the right group of friends. We can't bring Equestria back. No, Spike's voice laughed at me. You're not. The saw was so close now. If I didn't take the glyphs for protection, it would start cutting me. Let me show you so many secrets. No! I screamed, crying. I wanted those secrets. I tried to fight, but I really, really wanted them. I needed them. The saw go. was gone. The noises stopped. The healing booth was no longer a coffin, and I was no longer alone. Enough of this, Rarity said, stepping forward. She glared at the glyphs. You leave her alone. When? How? The beautiful white unicorn gave me a sad frown. I wasn't that strong either. She stared back at the glyphs as the other Ministry mares walked up out of the darkness behind me. The Black Book preys on you when you're weak and alone, but you're not alone anymore. I'm... How? Because you brought us together, didn't you? Applejack smiled. It's what you do. I think I know who you're looking for. I remembered telling Spike. It's happening differently this time, isn't it? Twilight Sparkle's voice was curious. Well, duh. Rainbow Dash hovered over her. Do you think it was the same when it was just Celestia? Same as boring. I reckon it's different every time. I was confused, yet comforted. I didn't know how, but they were with me. And with them, I had the strength to refuse and fight. But you don't want to fight, do you? Let me give you a taste of what I have to offer. Hey, Pinky, this is a great party, but I've got something that'll make it even better. Pinkie Pie said dourly, her expression cross. She was staring at the floating runes, but I didn't think she was seeing what the rest of us were. You've just got to try one of these. Just take one. They'll blow your mind. Her hoof stomped. Another voice echoed out of the darkness. Have you given up your principles for the greater good yet? Red Eye asked. I see you've already become a monster. Or did you think I wouldn't have heard about Abu? The blood began to rise. I don't like this feller, Applejack hissed. And just look at that. Red Eye's voice mocked as I felt what is a going on? on my late foreleg where my pit buck had merged with my flesh. You're becoming more like me every day. I'm not like you, I asserted, lying again. And I'm not a monster. I knew I was. I could see it in the mirror. Corrupted kindness, Trixie's voice accused triumphantly, her image floating above the mirror. Fluttershy stepped forward. How would you know? I'm the goddess. I know everything. Hush now, Fluttershy commanded, staring. Quiet now. The image of Trixie faded, looking abashed. Power, the black book casualed. Purpose. Together, we will unlock the world. Don't listen to it. Rarity strengthened. Applejack rested a hoof on my shoulder. You already got a purpose. You're the bringer of light, ain't you? I... I don't even know what that means. I shook my head. I don't have a purpose. I'm lost. I have no idea what I'm doing. Now you just listen here, Applejack said sternly. 
What I'm telling you is the honest truth. You do have a purpose. You're the one that brought them together, she said, as images of my friends floated at the edges of my vision. My living friends. Calamity. Velvet Remedy. Steelhoves. Zenith. Even Pyrelight. They were here with me, too. I felt tears. You find the good ones. Draw them out. Clear the path and light the way. Applejack smiled gently. There's a name for that, you know. I wanted to believe her so badly that I was trembling. But... I turned back to the mirror. To the shot-up, bleeding, and dying little Pip in the cobbled-together, gore-stained raider armor. Barely standing as she faced down her next kill, little Macintosh was floating in front of her, pointing upward. But... but this is my soul, isn't it? Yeah, of course it is, silly, Pinkie Pie said, hugging me suddenly and pointing at the mirror. You're just looking at it all wrong. Look behind you. I woke with a gasp, sitting up suddenly. Then I collapsed back onto the mattress. I felt awful, damp with sweat and caked with mud. Filthy. Almost too tired to move. My mane was clumped and stringy, but the nausea had gone, and my fever had broken. I was not alone in the room. Zenith, are you there? The zebra who moved closer wasn't my companion. Oh, Zephyr, I said, recognizing her. Where is every pony? I mean, every one. Zephyr pulled a wet sponge from a tin pot filled with water. Your other friend woke up an hour ago, she told me as she began to wipe my forehead. They are all with her right now. I wished I could be too. Zenith is my mother, isn't she? Zephyr asked. I froze, unsure of how to answer. Zenith had asked me not to, and I wanted to do right by her. But if Zephyr already suspected... Ah, uh, I thought so. Zephyr said as she continued to sponge me down, removing some of the illness sweat from my coat. She has tried to hide it. But how many zebra mares named Zenith does she think this wasteland holds? Smart girl. I shivered a little under the cool dampness of the sponge, but was immensely thankful for every stroke of it. I wanted a bath so much it hurt. I would give my left forehoof for a day at the Tamboni Spa. Yeah. You will be going soon, Zephyr gleaned. You will be taking her with you. Yes. I'm sorry. I will be happy to see her go, the young zebra mare told me bluntly. I am not ungrateful for all she has done, but she would not have done it if you had not led her. I winced. No, that's, that's not true. Yes, it is, Zephyr said, accepting no argument. I love her, from a distance. I felt an odd chill as the zebra's words echoed my thoughts from the evening before. But she is not her own mare, and she never will be. I will not be like her. Zephyr continued to sponge bathe me in silence. Your father? I began to ask. My father, the young zebra said bitterly, was Qual Deathhoof leader of our parents' tribe until that slaver griffin killed him. Stern. I was sure of it. I was just a little foal, but I remember how he treated my mother, and how he ran the tribe. I am not sorry he is dead. I knew I shouldn't be moving. My body wanted... If I'm getting this right, so they had an abusive father... She had an abusive father, or an abusive husband, or in this case, towards Zenith. Zenith has been a victim most of her life, and she progressively got worse. But now, she is safe with Pip, in a way.
Truth be told, I wish Zenith would become her own now. She needs a purpose, though, and that's what she lacks. But I, I think she will eventually get one. Excuse me, guys. I'm sorry. I think she'll eventually get a purpose. Wanted nothing but more rest. But still, I had to see Velvet Remedy. And I didn't want to go back to sleep. There were things waiting for me in my dreams. And not all of them met well. The ramshackle shack, it would be gruesome to call it a building, was Glyphmark's attempt at a clinic, and possibly the largest old house in town. The floors were broken, the roof was sagging, but it housed all of us. Velvet Remedy was being kept in what had once been a bathroom. The old tub, water stained and brown with traces of pink, was the only intact object in the room full of debris and shattered porcelain. I thought I'd lost you, Calamity was saying as I approached. I stopped, backing out of sight and not wanting to interrupt. My legs cried out that this would be a good time to lay down, or at least lean against something. And they were weary and tired of bearing my weight, and if I refused to sleep, then the least I could do was to get off of them. Now you know how I feel every time you go off and do something reckless. Velvet replied without malice. Nah. I don't think I could take this any more without you, Calamity told her. I'm struggling here, Velvet. It feels like all my friends are just falling apart, and I'm trying to be the strong one. But I ain't doing so good. No. I remembered what I had heard Calamity mutter to himself as we entered Stable 2. I gotta be strong for them, not go crazy. I can't just charge in and kill every armored bitch I see. I need to be strong. Need to watch for him. Need to protect him. I can do this. What's wrong, love? Velvet asked gently. What's eating at you? Buckling Cross. I winced. I've tried to make peace with it, but... Come closer, Velvet said in response. Let me hold you. I could hear Calamity's throat hitch. We were nothing but bullies, Velvet. Nothing better than bullies. We went in, demanded something we knew they wouldn't want to give, and it all ended in blood. Those young knights didn't deserve to die. My friend was crying now. I felt a lump in my own throat. My heart twisted in knots. I... I should have stopped us. I knew better. And that makes it all my fault. Hush now, love. Velvet cooed. She knew there wasn't anything she could say, so she wisely said nothing. I imagined she was holding him as he cried into her mane. And, and I'm terrified that I'm losing you too, Calamity said brokenly. What? No, love, Velvet soothed. You're not losing me. That crap you pulled in the Ministry of Peace is different, Calamity asserted. There was strength in his voice. I could tell he had pulled back from her. No, no, no. Don't say anything. I understand why I did it now, I guess. But you're too wrapped up in Fluttershy. Ain't right nor healthy putting all your faith in a pony you hardly know. I do know Fluttershy, Velvet insisted softly. Yeah, but there were things you don't know, Calamity replied, and all sorts of alarm bells started going off in my head. Oh no, 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 don't tell her. Oh? Velvet asked, and I swore the question sounded like poison. Like what? Calamity faltered. Well... I don't rightly know, but Little Pip seen things in those memory orbs, and... I could hear from the timbre in his voice that he knew the hole he was digging. So he changed track. Just remember, DJ Pony always says it's one big truth of the wasteland. We all done things we regret, and, well, it sounds to me like Fluttershy has some regrets, too. And Little Pip is keeping what she knows secret. Isn't she? 
to protect me, no doubt. Velvet hissed out a sigh. I guessed that Calamity had nodded. What a surprise. Little Pip keeping secrets from her friends. I swear if there was an element of frustration. Velvet, please, Calamity said softly. Don't be mad. She means well, really. And do you think she's right? Do you think I need to be protected from whatever this is? Well, I don't know. Calamity struggled. After the Ministry of Peace? Maybe. He found more solid ground as he told her. I just know you shouldn't have been so wrapped up in trying to be your idol. I had a sudden flash of Pinky Bell, and I bet Velvet remedied it, too. You're a wonderful, loving, caring pony all on your own. Just be yourself, Velvet. Just be yourself. I slipped out the front door, not wanting to interrupt the quiet moment Calamity and Velvet Remedy were sharing. I blinked in the odd daylight, once again recalling how strange the air seemed without the healing light of the sun. Ditsy Doo waved at me. I blinked again, taking in the sight of Ditsy Doo's delivery wagon. Absolutely everything. Yes, I do deliveries. She'd picked up a new companion, I noticed. A griffin bodyguard in talon armor. Now I knew who Calamity had rent now I knew who Calamity had been renting the steel armor from, and which Griffin he'd been signaling. Zenith had given Glyphmark a buck to the town's economy, and Ditsy Doo had taken only days to start trading with them. That was amazingly fast for word to have gotten out. I suspected a little bit of homage's hoof work here. A little lavender filly with a blonde mane trotted up to me. She was smiling a piece of parchment in her mouth. Here, Miss Little Pip, Silver Bell said, her voice almost singing. I painted a picture for you. See? It's you in homage. Oh. I floated the parchment up and gazed at the painting. It was a crude child's painting. And at the same time, it was the most beautiful picture I had ever seen. <laughs> oh, you're crying. Don't you like it? I tried really hard. I... I love it. I knelt down and hugged the little filly gently. I'm crying. I wondered what I had done to deserve such an innocent and wonderful gift. With deep shame, I remembered that I had once intended to steal from this little filly. Thank you, Silver Bell. Ditsy Doo had trotted up beside us. As I let Silver Bell go, I noticed that Ditsy had a couple little chalkboards dangling around her neck. This is moments like she this. Said, this, is, this is moments like this where I wish I had my own little kid. <laughs> it does. <laughs> one day I'll be a father. One day. One of them down, pulling out a piece of chalk and scribbled, "Hello." Hello, Ditsy Doo, I replied, floating the picture up next to me. I would have to find something in waterproof to keep it in until we returned to Junction R7, where I intended to put it up on a cherished place right next to my bed. Silverbell had somehow really captured homage and made her look absolutely adorable. Mm. Ditsy Doo erased the board with a hoof, then wrote, Can a horn grow back? She looked at me with an urgent smile, right eye rolling upwards disturbingly. I blinked. I don't rightly know. I thought about it some more. A horn is a bone, right? Minutes later, Velvet Remedy was kneeling next to Silver Bell, the older mare's horn glowing as Ditsy Doo Calamity and I watched. Now, I've gotten a lot better at this spell, Velvet cautioned, snarkily adding, thanks to an abundance of practice. But all I can do is help the physical horn grow back. I don't know if her magic will heal, or how long it might take. Thanks, Miss Velvet Remedy. Silver Bell chimed softly, understanding. Her eyes drifted to pyrelight, widening along with her smile. The majestic Balefire Phoenix began to sing to Silver Bell. Her song was rich, sadly nostalgic, and overwhelmingly beautiful. 
Velvet Remedy smiled gently and stretched out her magic. The scar on Silverbell's head where she had cut off her own horn began to glow. What do you think will happen to Silverbell? I asked Velvet as the Sky Bandit pushed its way through the smoky yellowed sky. I truly don't know, Velvet replied, giving a polite cough. I hope that with her horn reformed that her magic will swiftly return. But the Wasteland has never seemed that forgiving. She coughed again, and I found myself joining her. We were skirting the edge of the forest, heading towards Splendid Valley by way of Ponyville. The fires of Everfree Forest were choking the air in every direction around it. The forest had been burning for over a week now. It was consumed in flames and a thick fog of smoke. But from what I could see, it seemed absurdly intact. Damn! You'd have thought the whole place would be ash by now, Calamity called out, flying low to keep us out of the thicker smoke. Hey, Pilot, you sure this ain't a phoenix forest? Pyrelight let out a derisive hoot. Our attention was snatched by the sound of a gunshot. It was rapidly followed by several more. Calamity diverted towards the sound, and soon we came upon a firefight. Two groups were battling between the cover of rocks and what seemed like a charred corpse of a river serpent. Looks like raiders, Calamity called back. Raiders? Seriously? I'd already wiped out all of the raiders in Ponyville. What did they do, respawn? Who are they attacking? I asked, bringing up my EFS and trying to get a fix on both groups through the haze. The other raiders, I think. Calamity banked, and I got a better look. Sure enough, three younger raiders seemed to be holding out against four older ones. Neither side had lost a pony yet, but one of the two bucks in the younger group had taken a shot to the leg and was bleeding badly. I was mildly surprised that Calamity hadn't started shooting yet. Shouldn't we... help? Velvet asked, moving to the window next to me. Help who? Calamity questioned. I ain't sure who the good guys are here, if any pony. And I'm feeling a bit gun-shy after... recent events. Don't want to start shooting at any wrong folk. Sorry, hit the mic. Velvet Remedy gave an exaggerated sigh. There are more ways than that to help. She waved her horn as it began to glow. Below us, Velvet Remedy's shield began to snake between the two groups of fighters. Excuse me, Velvet's magically amplified voice rang out. Could you all please lower your weapons for a moment and tell me why you're fighting? What the hell? One of the older raiders responded by tipping up the muzzle of his rifle and taking a shot at Velvet Remedy. The bullet struck the now-armored wall of our passenger wagon. Wrong, Velvet informed him. Magic burst from her horn, striking him with her anesthetic spell. The raider buck toppled, paralyzed. Let's try that again. I had floated out my zebra rifle, thinking that I really needed a weapon that used more common ammunition and didn't set ponies horrifically on fire, and was holding myself in reserve. Calamity and I exchanged glances as we let Velvet Remedy's tactic play out. You got a fucking death wish or something? One of the older raiders shouted out. You out of your fucking mind? More shots rang out. Both sides were still trying to shoot each other through Velvet Remedy's shield. Neither was having any luck. They're raiders! One of the younger bucks shouted up at us. They wiped out the Republic! They wiped out the what now? I asked, confused. Little town up north of here, Calamity informed. I protected a few caravans traveling between it and New Appaloosa. Bizarre. Caught like group of weirdos, but not bad ponies. Certainly didn't deserve to be slaughtered. And who are you? Velvet asked. Look out! Calamity shouted as one of the larger group hurled a homemade explosive at the Sky Bandit. I caught at my telekinesis, pulling Velvet out of the window as the bomb exploded in the air, setting shards of glass and nail in every direction. Steelhoof stepped between Zenith and the window, his armor deflecting most of the shrapnel that found its way inside. I heard Calamity bite back a cry of pain as a nail tore through one of his wings. 
His barding and the sky banner protected him from the rest of it. We're heroes! The younger mare of the group of three yelled at us as the two bucks next to her reloaded. You all look like raiders! Velvet Remedy pointed out cautiously. What? One of the younger bucks cried out in surprise. Oh, the barding! I blinked, feeling my life had somehow come full circle. Okay! I called out, moving back into the window and aiming the zebra rifle. One of the raiders shot at us again, missing the entire sky bandit. You sure, little pip? We don't know. We know one side is shooting at us, Steel has pointed out impatiently, opening the door of the passenger wagon as the missile launcher opened in his battle saddles. Ah, oh, fuck! Some pony shouted from below. It's one of those outcast rangers! Whoosh. Steel of missiles shot out. One Not just any. Remedy's shield, which collapsed in a Not fiery. just any, he's the older. <laughs> yeah. Blast. The other plowed through the fire and struck the ground at the hooves of the older raiders in an explosion of bloody meat. Two managed to dive to safety, but their fellow raiders were bloody, smoldering giblets. The two survivors turned their attention fully towards us. One of them pulled out another homemade grenade. I prepared to grab it with my magic. Let me give you a taste of what I have to offer. I suddenly understood. The spell was so simple. It was barely more than telekinesis. The easiest thing, really. My horn began to glow. The no. splatter blood from the torn raider chunks began to flow together, pulling, lifting. I realized this was the first spell, the little teaser offered to any pony who might be... who might be what? Fitting? Worthy? Weak enough? Now just form the blade. Be unwavering. No! I shouted, my scream simultaneous with the raider's throw. The blood splashed back to the ground, seeping into the soil. Velvet Remedy threw another shield up, this time between us and the raiders, deflecting the bomb. It exploded, sending its shrapnel to the shield. No. I was shaking. A cold sweat had broken over me. But I had refused. I would rather be a one-trick pony than have a spell like that. Man, I've never seen a zebra before. The Olive Buck walked around Zenith as she watched him apprehensively. I mean, not a real one. You don't look like the ones in the pictures. He tilted his head, brushing a wisp of eggplant-colored mane from his face. Can your eyes really glow? Steelhoofs had made short work of the battle, and we had landed. Velvet Ramony was tending to the wounded Buck and Calamity was talking to the group's mare who had recognized the Pegasus from tales of his caravan protecting. Her eagerness to chat with him about hunting raiders had convinced him that we had aided the correct side. We had yet to trade names, however. Haven't you heard about the Wasteland heroine? The younger mare in scavenge raider armor said excitedly. She and her friends just swoop in and save the day, shooting the bad guys and monsters dead. Pow, pow, pow! The amber mare's magenta eyes were wide, and she was nearly squealing. We're gonna be just like her. Oh my god. No. My ears fell back. I cringed a little inside, happy I was not wearing my stable barding anymore. Calamity was looking at me, a hoof to his muzzle, snickering. Damn it, why was he snickering? Are you sure she'd really want you putting yourselves at risk hunting raiders? Velvet asked carefully as she wrapped the buck's hind leg in healing bandages. I'm sure the Wasteland heroine wouldn't want you getting hurt. The way she massaged the name made me flush with embarrassment. The radio was bad enough. I took a step back behind steel hooves, my ears burning. Right, right, she probably wouldn't, her patient insisted, a khaki-coated pony with a vanilla-colored mane. But she wants us to make Equestria a better place. And DJ Pony says we all need to learn from her example. Yeah, she can't be everywhere at once. 
the olive-coated second buck explained. It's up to the rest of us to be brave enough and step up, help and fight the good fight, you know? Is this turning into NGR? This was way too much. NGR. I never deserved my reputation. But after Arbu, the NGR, this was unbearable. G no, GNR, GNR. Why should any pony idolize me? I wanted to bury myself in a hole somewhere until this was all over. Thanks, you're a lifesaver. The khaki-coated buck told like, Velvet Ramp. I, I know that's what DJ Pony is supposed to be, the GNR thing. Uh, it's supposed to be a GNR thing, you know. I know what it's supposed to be. Because I remember when GNR was, you know, establishing all the good things about, the, about it. Because in Fallout 3, every action you took, GNR announced it. That was the actual thing that happened. I remember when I tuned in the radio, I found in about the violin thing, about going into vaults, one of the vaults. Um, and that was a pretty interesting vault, by the way. I loved it because I, it was a... I actually like that vault. I know the vaults are terrible. The vault was still terrible. But I actually like this vault because it vaulted, revolt, revolted around mind control using sound frequencies. That's where the violin was placed. So, anyway. Remedy, she finished binding his wound. If anything, the equestrian wasteland needs more ponies like you. Velvet blinked in surprise. Why, thank you, she breathed. Hey, the buck exclaimed, his eyes widening as he stared at Velvet Remedy. You sound kind of like that gal on the radio, the one who sings the new songs. Pyrolite landed on Velvet's tail and sang out a musical note. Velvet Remedy blushed. You have a good ear. At least she was used to having fans. Oh my god. Wow, the Olive Buck said, staring at Steel Hoofs. Are you really one of those renegade Steel Ranger heroes? Steel Hoofs whinnied. I am. That is so cool, the Buck responded enthusiastically. So you're hunting raiders? Calamity asked, sounding impressed. Yep, we're on a mission, the enthusiastic Amber Mare said. A scowl broke over her face. These raiders murdered every adult in the Republic and took all the fillies and colts back to their fort. I guess they probably want to keep them for themselves, so we're going after them. Yeah, they probably want to play things, the khaki buck snorted, his voice filled with loathing. Calamity bristled. Velvet Remedy gasped. They did what? Oh, Where is no. this fort? I asked, stepping forward, my personal embarrassment forgotten. The Olive Buck pointed to Hoof. There's an old hut on the far side of Ponyville, right up next to the Everfree Forest. Damn it. I thought I had cleared Ponyville of raiders. This place must have been far enough out that I missed it. They've turned it into the center of a small compound. How many? Steel has asked. Uh, about twelve. Minus these four, so eight. But they have guns and dogs. Zenith looked to me. No more distractions, she asked calmly. I bit my lower lip. Steel has neighed. The rest of you can go ahead if you wish. But Applejack would not want her rangers to ignore a cry for help. The three younger ponies were staring at us. I nodded. The goddess is just going to have to wait another hour or two. We had a chance to help, and I wasn't going to turn my back. No distractions be damned. That's right, Pip! Velvet Remedy was trembling. That's... I nodded. I wasn't surprised now that I had missed this raider group. The cottage they had built their compound around really was a bit removed from the rest of town. It was surrounded by a large fence of rust and razor wire. No! Sharpened poles no! And no! Rapids no! And they fu- No! They tainted Fluttershy's cottage! They tainted it! They tainted it! Fuck you, raiders! Sorry.
small animals, sickly poisoned trees twisted up from the barren ground, providing support for sniper nests. Dead birds hung from their branches, strung together like wind chimes. A small river slogged through the property coming out of the Everfree Forest, the water gray with ash. Inside the fence were kennels, some of which were used for the angry, malnourished guard dogs that roamed about inside. As for the other kennels, through my binoculars I could see the mangled body of a pony in one of them. Fluttershy's cottage, Steele has confirmed. The fence on the far side of the cottage lay in broken ruin, several trees on that side having been uprooted and a few kennels having been crushed flat. It looked like something huge had lumbered out of the Everfree Forest, barely noticing what it had stepped on. A couple raider ponies were standing over the wreckage, poking at it, while a third was keeping the dogs from escaping with a shield spell, much like velvets. I passed the binoculars to Calamity. Could you give us a flyover? Make sure there's nothing we're missing. The Pegasus took off his hat, threw the binocular strap around his neck, and kicked his hat back onto his head. Gotcha, little pip. One aerial recon coming up. Let's kill them all. Kill them all! The Amber Mare stared at Calamity as he stretched his wings out and flew. Pegasuses are so cool. Pegasi. Velvet Remedy corrected automatically. Yeah, those two. We should split up. Steel has recommended. Hit the main hut and the yard simultaneously. Keep them divided. I agreed. You should go with these ponies and take the ones in the yard. Zenith can free any captives and get them to safety while you four take out the... Three, Velvet interrupted. You are not sending this buck into battle with a wounded leg, she scolded. Especially when he might have to evade dogs. I frowned and nodded. You're right. I wasn't thinking. The fact that I regularly charged into combat wounded didn't mean it was smart especially since this little group of wannabe heroes didn't have a velvet remedy of their own. I looked to Steelhoofs. It looks like most of the foals are inside that cottage. That group needs a combat medic. That's all I gotta say. Calamity and I will sneak in and get them out. I looked to Velvet. I'd like you right behind us with your shield spell ready. I don't want any of these kids caught in crossfire. She nodded primly. Wait. The khaki buck said. You're taking her with you? Are you insane? Velvet Remedy gave him a questioning scowl. I'm not helpless. You're a healer. You should be protected. Kept out of combat. I understood his logic. The loss of Velvet Remedy was the loss of not just one pony, but countless. Velvet huffed. Why not put me in a pretty little cage then? Calamity landed before an argument could break out. Three raiders in the yard, including a unicorn with defensive spells. Man, Two Velvet doesn't in the like being held back. I, I gotta give. I, I know it's like, I know it's a, it's not a good thing, but hey, it's. I'm just saying, it's pretty. He's not wrong. Usually, medics are kept out of the fray. Usually, and um, trust me, you want to keep your medics. Anyway. Restaurant sad. He frowned. I spotted lots of mutilated carcasses, but only two living colts in the cages. They're letting the dogs nip at them. The others must be inside as well. I looked at Velvet with a sudden concern as I remembered the horrors I had encountered in the Ponyville library and the carousel boutique. Velvet, are you sure you don't want to stay behind on this one? From what I've seen, these raiders take pleasure in desecrating the former homes of Fluttershy's closest friends. Velvet Remedy walked forward. I'm not staying behind. Let's go. Calamity flew me in through an open window on the second floor of Fluttershy's cottage. It still pissed me off what they did to the library. I'll be honest, it pissed me off what they did to the library. As soon as I had my footing... I levitated Velvet Remedy in after us, covering my muzzle, my eyes watering from the stench. 
the inside of the cottage was beyond foul. The bedroom had been willingfully destroyed. The bed, still displaying a bit of its butterfly motif in the carving, had been set on fire with a broken lantern, and the burnt remains used as a toilet. Repeatedly. Pictures were knocked from shelves and smashed. Books were defiled. A fireplace was filled with a pile of skulls, some with rotting meat still on the bones. The rotting carcasses of small animals hung from the rafters. Some sort of wicked bluish ivy had crawled up one wall and entwined with the rafters before dying. I suspected the raiders had poisoned the ground, killing all plant life, as well as any animals unfortunate enough to try to find food or water here. Velvet Remedy rushed to the window and threw up. I felt disgusted, not only at what I was seeing and smelling, but because I wasn't at the window doing the same. Velvet Ramony moved back from the window as we heard voices from downstairs. You want a knife? Little Bucky didn't need a knife. A cruel mare's voice laughed. Ah, uh, give the kid a knife. A buck growled. Makes it more interesting. I slowly crept towards the stairwell, calamity in front of me. Now remember, kids. A third voice chuckled as I reached the railing and looked down. The room below was filled with old rusty cages. Most were empty, but there were nearly half a dozen foals locked up inside some of them. They were all staring down at the center of the room, eyes wide with terror. Several were crying. The center of the floor had been torn up. Two fillies and a colt were in the hole, a tangled mesh of rusty barbed wire ringing it. One of the fillies was crumpled in the dirt, bleeding from multiple wounds, the flesh torn from her scalp. The colt looked battered and was breathing heavily, keeping weight off of one foreleg. Both he and the standing filly were shaking, tears running down their young faces. The raiders were gathered around their crude, homemade version of the pit, smoking, drinking, and lounging on furniture that integrated with the bones of ponies. No. The one that survives gets the bodies of their parents back. No. No! No! They've taken it more! And then worst of all, they killed these Phillies' parents! And they're making them fight to the death! What the fuck?! What the hell?! Blam. How dare Dare you! Velvet Remedy screamed, swiveling her combat shotgun towards the second raider as the first fell. The wasteland isn't hard enough, sick enough, without you monsters making it worse. Blam. The second shot tore the left hind leg and flank off of the second raider. He collapsed, screaming, in a pool of his own blood. And in Fluttershy's house! Velvet Remedy tossed her shield up over the children as she marched down the stairs, her expression full of unbridled fury. I watched, frozen. I'll have your head on a fucking plate, the raider mare screamed as she dove for a riot shotgun. Blam. Our shotgun surgeon splattered open the chest of the wounded raider. How dare you be this foul! Outside, we could hear explosions interspersed with the irregular gunshot. Steelhose was engaging the enemy. The raider mare swung around, the riot shotgun in her muzzle, and found herself facing down Velvet Remedy's barrel. The raider seemed to freeze, staring at the black hole of her death. Our unicorn was trembling with rage. I've never killed a pony before, she said her voice soft but still amplified by her spell. This is Velvet's Arbu, I thought suddenly. At least she had the benefit that no pony anywhere would question the vileness of the ponies she was eradicating. At least she was saving children, not scarring them. Blam! Velvet lowered the shotgun, turning away from the third raider's raggedly decapitated body. As far as I'm concerned, I still haven't. 
the little colt Bucky was bawling, going on and on about how he didn't mean to hurt her, how he didn't mean to kill her, how the raiders had made him do it. The small filly with the head injury was dead. She had expired before we could get to her. Velvet Remedy hugged the colt, soothing him as best she could despite looking shell-shocked herself. We had managed to save nine foals in all. There had been three outside. One with a black coat, who had curled up so far inside his cage that even Calamity hadn't spotted him. To our surprise, he was a Pegasus, great-grandson of a Dashite named Radar. Calamity had heard of the rogue Pegasus. Last one to give the Enclave the kiss off before my time, he told me. I was putting the burden of getting the foals to safety on the three young heroes. The yard yeah. of the cottage had a wagon filled with cages. Undoubtedly how the raiders had brought the foals here. It would serve as lightly armored transportation. Pegasus is all there. I had seen that the wounded buck now had the riot shotgun. Once Calamity had worked his repair wizardry on it, the riot shotgun had become a truly respectable weapon. Even better than Velvet's own. They should be able to make it to New Appaloosa as long as they went straight there. New Appaloosa wasn't my favorite place to send refugees, but it was the only place close. Junction R7 was too far, and the only place closer had apparently been the Republic. They couldn't go back there. I wish we could come with you, I told the Amber Mare, realizing I had never gotten her name. But we really have to get going now. She nodded. Thanks. The Wasteland Heroine would be proud of you. I looked obliquely, reddening. I, uh... Yeah. I hope so. I kicked my hoe from the dirt. <laughs> Any pony ever tell you you're kinda cute like that? She asked, then gave me a little kiss on the cheek before scampering off to her friends. They were trying to coax the little colts and fillies onto the wagon. I blinked my thoughts blown apart. Within half an hour, the wagon was pulling away, hauled by the two unwounded young heroes. Steelhoofs had ensured the raiders outside had never gotten to harm them, and they were headed to New Appaloosa with the story of the heroism and awesome <laughs> might of the Applejack's rangers. I could almost feel a warmth radiating off of Steelhoofs. He had done Applejack proud, and he knew it. I hoped he was finally beginning to really heal. Please, heal. I turned and looked at Velvet. She had managed to hold together until the wagon was moving. But as I watched, she began to tremble. Then she collapsed in sobs. Calamity was there to catch her. Why? Why does it all have to be so horrible? Velvet sobbed. How can these... How can these horrible creatures be ponies? I stared at the ground, having wondered the same thing. We fight, and we hurt, and we bleed to make Equestria better, Velvet said, burying her face in Calamity's neck. But you can't stop something until you take away its reason for being that way. I thought of the pink cloud. And, but, there's no reason for raiders, no reason for them to be so so vile. No reason at all. The sun was setting as Calamity landed the Sky Bandit at the edge of Splendid Valley. All about us were dead ponies, and the strewn wreckage of a military... Guys, this, this, this chapter is making me very emotional. My friend, uh, 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 Oscar, you did say this chapter would be a doozy. I was, I'm hope, I'm wondering if this is the doozy or I'm just in for something big. Camp. One of Red-Eye's banners, on slightly something. scorched, flapped in the wind. Well, we're fucked. Calamity stated as he detached himself from the Sky Bandit's harness. 
After the other morning, he had jury-rigged a quick-release mechanism. He'd spent the last few hours skirting the boundary of the valley, looking for this camp. This was one of those parts of the plan I had told him about before extracting my memories. The notes I had left myself on my pit book were very vague, clearly written to be reassuring, but not informative. But they did include a mention that we were supposed to stop here just before flying into the valley itself. I wasn't sure exactly why, but I suspected it had something to do with whatever I had gone into Red Eye's encampment around Tempony Tower for. Something important enough that I took another party time in town, so I was really hoping it was damn vital. Or maybe not, seeing as how whomever you were supposed to meet here had been dead for days. Large black birds were picking at the carcasses. I felt queasy as one of them pulled the eyeball from an armored corpse of a brown stallion. These wounds are from Alicorn's spells, Steelhose noted, moving amongst the bodies. The goddess's children did this. A total massacre. And not a single Alicorn dead. Damn. I'm guessing this means that the goddess and Red Eye ain't even pretending to be on the same side anymore. Not necessarily, Steelhose offered. This could be a preemptive strike. Or maybe she just doesn't like part of his army sitting this close. The more I saw, the more this struck me as part of the forces that withdrew from Tempony Tower. Either way, I doubt Red Eye has the benefit of instant communication. There's a good chance he doesn't know this happened, and when he finds out. The goddess could pass this off as an unfortunate attack by something out of Everfree. Well... Is that it, then? Calamity asked me. Plan over? I shook my head. I... I don't know. I was the wrong person to ask. I looked around for Zenith. She had disappeared again. Velvet was curled up in the Sky Bandit. Pyrelight was stroking her with a wing. Look, if we're still a go- I just realized that, um... Pyre lights, uh, Velvet's Angel, even though Angel's a dick most of the time. I mean, when, when Fluttershy's upset, Angel is there to support Fluttershy. You know, pat her head, you know, calm her down. That's when F Angel's a good friend, by the way. And by the way, I hate Angel Bunny. He's a fucking asshole. That's my, that's my statement for the day. Angel Bunny is a fucking asshole. Go, Calamity told me. I want to leave Velvet back Quote to you with on that. She's not in any shape to be doing anything else right now. I agreed. Assuming, of course, that the plan allowed them to remain behind. Damn it. Where had the zebra vanished off to this time? I rotated and jumped back as I found myself muzzle to muzzle with the striped face of our zebra. What we need is still here, she said cryptically, her exotic voice low and urgent. We best move swiftly. I have seen the goddess's children just beyond the edge. They are engaged with a hydra, but the battle will not last long. A hydra? I suddenly guessed that I knew what had stomped its way past the slaver encampment in Fluttershy's cottage. Do what you must, little Pip. I nodded, both relieved that a things hydra. were still on track and stunned that. by the thought of a hydra. Part of me really wanted to see that battle but I knew I wouldn't. I checked the notes on my pit buck just to make sure. But I was right. Now, it was time for me to put on the blindfold. I peeked. I couldn't help myself. As Calamity soared across Splendid Valley, hauling the Sky Bandit behind him, I heard the roars of the Hydra, and I just had to look. One peek couldn't hurt, right? The first thing I saw was that I was all alone in the Sky Bandit. That shocked me. I felt certain that at least Zenith would be with me as well. I scrambled to the window, looking out. But there was nothing to see. Splendid Valley stretched on for miles. I could see Maripony on the horizon, and the crater filled with hundreds of hellhound holes. Thunder cracked, and the Hydra roared again, telling me that I was looking out the wrong side of the passenger wagon. What you moving around so much for? Calamity asked as I shifted to the opposite window. 
I felt a pang of guilt, but it was swiftly washed away by the spectacle of the battle. One alicorn lay crushed and bloody on the ground. A second was in the mouth of the hydra's head farthest to its left. The monster was absolutely huge, and the head must be able to swallow the alicorn whole. Damn! Only her wings protruded from its closed maw, fluttering limply as it chewed the life out of her. Three Imagine more they showed that shit in My Little hydra. Pony. Dodge. Because we did see the hydra and they avoided it completely. And I'm just imagining that hydra just tearing people apart, or ponies apart. And I'm now imagining what they would do to the main six shit. Oh well. Watching the remaining heads as they snapped at their prey. One of the Hydra heads sucked in a deep breath and blasted out some sort of gas, enveloping one of the goddess's magically shielded children. The purple alicorn's shield seemed to protect her. She tilted up a wing, spinning in place as the second head's maw opened wide and folded her wings. There was a flash of light where the alicorn used to be. The head of the gaping Hydra exploded with a wet sound, the crumpled and blood-soaked form of the purple alicorn falling to the ground. I gaped. The alicorn had sacrificed itself and teleported inside of the monster's skull. Quickly, I blindfolded myself again, thankful that my head was too small for such a grotesque tactic. Welcome back, my guests. The chorus of voices drowned out my thoughts. My children will guide you that you may bask in the presence of the great and powerful goddess. Please stop. My head began to throb. I felt the sky bandit touch down. I waited. According to my notes, Calamity would tell me when I could take the blindfold off. I heard him release himself from the harness. I listened as his hoofsteps drew near. He stopped outside the door. And we waited. Why do you loiter? Oh, don't you know? I thought at her. Okay, little pip, Calamity said. I lifted the blindfold. There were two dark green alicorns standing on the path ahead, and I could see dozens gathered around the Maripony ruins. Just standing there, staring at us. Mindlessly. No, not mindlessly. One-mindedly. I shuddered at the thought. I'm not going to be here when y'all are finished, Calamity told me his extreme dislike of this plan clear with every word. My eyes opened wide. I knew I was going in alone, but I hadn't realized my ride was leaving without me. What the hell? How was I supposed to? The Pegasus friend pointed towards a section of the rubble. There's your ride out. I followed his hoof and spotted a bit of pink hidden in the wreckage. The Griffin Chaser too. I had wondered what had happened to that after we had left Old Olne. The goddess grows impatient. Yeah, yeah, I'm on my way in, I thought. I've got what you asked for. Just hold your alicorns. There was only one set of instructions left in my notes. Keep your eyes forward, sparkle up, stall, and wait for the signal. This time... The goddess's alicorns had not led me to the observation room, but right into the heart of the goddess herself. I levitated myself above the dusty lake of IMP, and stared up between the vats at the floating face of the goddess. Lights on my EFS compass indicated the two green alicorns flanking me, and then a vague, untargetable haze that seemed to fill the rest of the room. The haze was brightest when I swiveled my head towards the vat that Trixie had fallen into so many decades ago. I found myself dreading this. Even as I spoke with her, telling the goddess what I had found, I knew that I was just delaying the inevitable. The black book was in my saddlebags, cold against my flank. And I had brought it here. On purpose. I was about to let it fall into the hooves of the absolute worst pony who could ever gain it. On purpose. There was no amount of heroic acts or lives saved that would make up for this evil. Weather control, that is all. The goddess expected more from Red Eye. What manner of threat is that? 
you're the one that assumed what he was after in the Ministry of Awesome was a threat to you. I reminded the Trixie thing, speaking aloud because just thinking at the floating light show pony above my head was just a little too creepy. Then clearly this single pony project is a threat, and just a very clever one that will take the goddess a moment to comprehend. But just a moment. Ah, yes. I stared, trying not to let disbelief project too strongly. Or maybe it was not this single Pegasus project that he was after. Tell me everything you saw in the Ministry of Awesome. Well, stalling wasn't going to be hard. Stall? Why do you stall? Foolish little pony. There is nothing that you can do that is of concern or consequence to the mighty goddess. Standing there, staring at that amorphous blob of nothing before me, I began to suspect that she was right. How the hell was I supposed to stop the goddess? Shoot her? A lot? Unless I had picked up bullets of goddess killing, that just wasn't going to do a damn thing. And she had every spell of the alicorns. Probably every spell of Trixie, Twilight, Mosaic, and Gestalt. If not every unicorn she had consumed. And that's a lot of spells, but it's how Twilight's in the mix. She could think me dead. This was hopeless. Yes, your silly little plan against the goddess is hopeless. The goddess is not impressed. You... Wait, who? What? Who? What, are you an owl now? I suddenly thought of Wadsworth. You thought of names. Think the names again. Oh. Whoops. There was no way I could have foreseen the star orb when making this plan. Did I just... trip up on something? Stall. Well, here goes nothing. I thought of the orbs, remembering them as best as I could. Every detail, focusing most heavily on the star orb. I spent what felt like hours replaying Canterlot in my head. Even when I sensed the approach of others, more alicorns I assumed, I did not stop. I went over each memory orb multiple times, but kept coming back to the star orb. Whatever I did, the goddess grew quiet in my mind. I think the memory stunned her. Finally, she demanded I stop. Enough of that memory. It... It is not important. I suspected deeply that it was the most important memory ever. But I didn't have time to investigate my suspicions. The location identifier started flashing on my eyes forward sparkle. But it wasn't telling me where I was. How could it? I'd been in the same place for hours. In fact, it wasn't telling me anything. Just flashing, getting my attention. This must be the signal. But what do I do now? Then, it told me. Run. Zenith has planted the Balefire Bomb beneath Maripony. Your friends are safely away. You have 38 minutes to get clear. What? Wait, wait. What? 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 The Balefire Bomb is here? How did it get here? How did Zenith get it past all the Hellhounds? I knew she was sneaky, but that was just beyond the pale. How could I have asked her to take that risk? How is and that I even possible? Let's just just happen. I'm gonna know how this how is that machine. That's insane. What was I doing standing here? Why the hell would I have gone into this place? Why would I have? Even as I panicked, the pieces of my plan fell into place. Of course I had to be unnaturally persuasive. What could have been more difficult, more worthy of resorting to party time mint owls, than talking Red Eye into giving me the bomb? No wonder he'd started pulling out after that. He was taking the bomb to his camp. Ten Pony Tower hadn't been under a mega spell threat in over a week. I'd made homage safe before I'd even left. What we need is still here, Zenith had said. I remembered how small the Balefire Bomb looked in Pinky Bell's barn. 
small enough a little filly could move it around, if with difficulty. I remembered okay. going to speak with a god, but I'd cut out the memory of what had happened in Shattered Hoof. Blackwing, I remembered saying. I was hoping to see you. I have something I need to ask you for, and I hope we could come to an agreement. I remembered all the times I had lost track of Xanath in battle. How she'd managed to follow me without the Twilight Society catching her. Xanath had Blackwing's Zebra Stealth Cloak. And Zebra Stealth Cloak's even mute scent. You have 37 minutes to get clear. But why would I have... Don't watch any of these until after you slash I get the Black Book and take it to Mariponi. I'd written that to myself, then told Calamity to allow me to view those two orbs we had picked up from the merchant just before we went to Satterthoof. The argument between Applejack and Rarity flashed through my head. You said you were going to get rid of that cursed thing. I said I would try and burn it. And I tried. But as you can see, it doesn't burn. I even tried to have Spike burn it. All that did was send it to Princess Celestia. Well, you still should have gotten rid of it. How? I doubt anything short of a mega spell could destroy it. And I certainly don't want to dispose of the book where it could find its way into the wrong hooves. You were going to blow it up? You were going to leave it there so that way it could die along with the goddess. I didn't bring the black book here to give it to the goddess. I brought it here to destroy it once and for all crushed two eggs under one hoof. The little pony in my mind was prancing nervously, trying to shout down my thoughts with the scream of bomb, bomb, get away from the bomb. The zebra. Crap. I floated the black book out of my saddlebags and tossed it into the taint. It splashed, then bobbed, the twisted and profane black leather floating with the debris. No. Think of all the great things you could do. I backpedaled, my mind finally working. I needed to get out of here, now. You could save Twilight Sparkle. My eyes were still locked on the book. Don't! But the little pony in my head was screaming. No! There was no- No! No! Don't give in! Do not give in! No time for that anymore. Thump. Hold on, I'm starting to feel like this is a Skyrim cro Skyrim crossed with My Little Pony crossed with fucking Fallout. Oh, look in. Backed into some pony. My panic skyrocketed. My heart skipping a beat. And my levitation magic imploded. Dropping me into the murky lake of taint. I spun around to see who was blocking my exit. Three ponies in enclave armor stood, blocking the doorway. In front of them, a stately, dusk-colored pegasus flew forward, dressed in sophisticated gray barding with a sleek military elegance. Greetings, goddess, the pegasus called out, staring up at Trixie's light show, seemingly unfazed. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Harbinger, and I am here on behalf of the Enclave. It's an Enclave experiment, all right, Calamity had said about the science project we had found in Old Olney. Under orders of Harbinger, one of the Enclave High Council. The goddess had more important things on her mind. Children, flee! As did I. I desperately searched for a way around them. I could try floating them, but they had wings. I wouldn't be able to hold them in place just by lifting their hooves off the ground. I could try to fight my way through, but these were Enclave. It could be like fighting three or four calamities, and I would so thoroughly lose. Even if I won, my injuries would assure that I didn't get out in time. You have 36 minutes to get clear. There's no need to flee, Harbinger assured the Otis calmly. Say there's a bomb! In fact, I've come to offer you an alliance between the Enclave and the Goddess. I froze, my jaw dropping. Wait, what? For the briefest moment, I oh, forgot no. about the bomb, turning to stare at the Pegasus. The goddess was ultimately genocidal. 
her plans for Equestria meant the end of all ponies, and worse, the end of all individuality. She was a horror, and the Enclave wanted to ally with her? Fly, my children, save yourselves! Okay, and part of me was a little impressed with the goddess. Trixie knew she was about to die, and her final act was to save the Alicorns. Damn. We have recently become aware of what the pony Red Eye is doing, Harbinger stated. We know he opposes you and has plans to overthrow you. His intentions with the towers pose a clear and imminent danger to the Enclave and its citizens. His intentions are nothing short of an act of war. Why don't oh, you s this was not happening. I pranced anxiously in the taint, looking around for an alternate escape route. Goddesses, even if I found one, there wouldn't be enough time for me to get away. But the Enclave military is... Harbinger permitted himself a chuckle. Let us just say, formidable. Should we combine our efforts, I have no doubt we can deal with Red Eye and eliminate the threat he poses to us entirely. Swiftly. You have 35 minutes to get clear. Get out! Get oh, no. out! No, 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 no. This is bad. I need to find a way out now. And with the threat of Red Eye and his plots wiped away, Harbinger concluded, smiling the earnest grin of a politician. You could rule all of Equestria below unchallenged. Shut up! You will remain man. above. Oh my god! And we will all know peace in our time. Please stop! The observation. And you just said the title of the chapter! designed to protect against the mega spell detonation. It had saved Twilight Sparkle before. Of course, it had also trapped her inside. But I'd worry about that later. Breaking into a full gallop, I telekinetically launched myself to one of the remaining catwalks and ran for the observation room. What's she doing? Harbinger asked. Ambrosia, get after her! One of the black carapace pegasi took to the clear. air, giving chase. My heart was pounding in my chest. An odd itch was creeping through the insides of my legs, spreading out. You have thirty-four minutes to get clear. I dashed into the observation room, looking around frantically. Last time, this place sealed up in reaction to the Balefire Bomb's explosion. But this time, it would go off right beneath Maripony. In the time we took the shutters to close, I'd be dead from the heat alone. But I knew Twilight Sparkle wouldn't create a safe room with such a fatal flaw. There had to be some manual way of telling the safe room to seal. You have thirty minutes left to get clear. Hold it! Ambrosia ordered as she landed outside, folding her wings and trotting through the door. I paid her no attention, searching with mounting panic. I said hold! the armored enclave mare demanded. As in freeze right where you're fucking standing or I'll turn you into a glowing pile of soup. Bomb! I shouted at her in frustration, scanning all the controls and monitors for anything that might trigger the room's lockdown. What bomb? She barked. What are you talking about? And I said freeze, damn it. I heard the magical energy weapons built into her armor begin to power up. Relief washed over me as I spotted the removable panel. I froze, looking towards Ambrosia, smiling as my horn glowed. Behind me, the screws on each corner of the panel rotated and fell out. The panel dropped to the floor with a clunk. The sound caught the Enclave soldier's attention. When she looked towards the panel, so did I. There was a nice big red button marked, Push to Initiate Safe Room Protocol. I gave it a hard buck. What did you do? Ambrosia cried out as the doors closed and the armored plate came down. <sighs> she spun, watching massive armored shutters lower over the windows. What did you just do? You have thirty-two minutes to get clear. Good morning, children. This is DJ Pony, coming at you over the airwaves. And guess what's riding hot on my tail? That's right, the news. That bright light and roll of thunder that Alati reported from the vicinity of Splendid Valley just over forty hours ago? The one Alati said was like a megaspell going off. 
Well, it turns out, it really was a mega spell going off. Right in the heart of Splendid Valley. Now, I don't have a lot of details, but I can confirm that a whole mess of alicorns fled the valley less than half an hour before the detonation, and I can now confirm reports that our wasteland heroine was on the Ponyville side of the Splendid Valley area earlier that day. Now, I don't know yet if there's any connection, but if I was a betting pony, I'd say our bringer of light had her hoof in what happened there. Not really the light I was talking about, Stable Dweller. Our prayers go out to you. I hope you're okay. If you, or any pony else, has further information, please let me know, right away. As for reports of odd behavior from the alicorns in the wake of this occurrence, or claims of seeing odd black ponies flying through the sky, I can only... Greetings, citizens of the Equestrian Wasteland. This is the Grand Pegasus Enclave. We have commandeered this broadcast to deliver an important message to all ponies. Do not be afraid. We are here to save you. Don't pull a Brotherhood of Steel on me! Oh my god, they just pulled a Brotherhood of Steel! And look at all these other chapters. <sighs> Fuck. Anyway, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this awesome episode of Fallout Equestria. And this one got me a lot of emotions. See, there's a lot of shit happening that killed her. I don't know what is happening, little Pip. I hope she survived, and I really hope that something happens. She, she probably survived since she is the main character. But seriously, I really hope that... She gets out of there. Well, anyway, I'll catch you guys later. And stay nerdy, my friends. Bye!